Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another exciting episode of Guns Up. As always, I'm your host, Sean L. Christ, joined by the co-host and living legend, J.C. Knight. J.C., how in the hell have you been, brother? Man, I'm good. Uh, looks like we're going to be doing a car stop from Bob Knight in the friendly confines of Buffalo, West Virginia. So I can't get on the road to talk to Marines, so thanks for having me, Sean. Oh, not a problem. Any uh, any time I can help you out with this, and and I actually enjoy this myself. I think it's something new. It's something that I think needs to get out there more of, and we have the ability to do it. So we're going to go ahead and do it. We well, both of us, I know, are just probably getting sick of what's going on in the news and the headlines and all about the political crap. So I'm tired of that. So usually the show we'll pick out some topics, we'll talk about it, and we'll have our opinions on it. And that's our point. It's our opinions on it. It's not fact. It's just how we believe based on the experience we had. So. This change in programming is basically something that's a passion for both of us. And I think that's also informative to those that are in the military and those that are in the military because it gives you a little insight to some of the stuff that you don't see behind closed doors. So today, as you saw on the title screen, we're going to be talking about a new weapon system that's called the Carl Gustav. The Carl Gustav is going to replace another rocket launching platform that we've used. And what better person than to tell us about it is other than J.C. Knight, who is in his beloved Marine Corps for 23 years and did nothing but just instruct, mentor, and teach Marines on weapon systems. So, sir, I'm going to tell you what. I'm going to digress. I'm going to let you take the podium, and the floor is yours, my friend. Awesome. So, what I want to try to do is we're going to try to kick my material to it. Please do, too. So, uh, what I always do when I'm doing these briefs live with Marines is I always like to start off with the history of, of the system and how we got to where we are and where we're going. Uh, Sean and I have talked offline many times. Uh, oh, here, shut your mouth, take this, carry it, because I said so. We're the Marine Corps. We've always done it. Uh, that's not good business practice. No, it's, it's, it's absolutely the worst thing you can do. And I'm not even just talking about the Marine Corps. Obviously, that's where you experience it. But you also experience it in other aspects. Like when I was a manager at Rye Auto Parts, you get the same thing. I can't tell you how many times you're going to turn me off or I'm not going to listen to you because I think you don't know what the hell you're talking about and you're a dinosaur when I hear, this is the way we do things, this is the way we do it. Let me explain something to you. This isn't the only way you can do things. You could sit there and do things many ways. In fact, let me explain how this works. If you want to stay inside this box and that's all you want to do, you're going to get people killed and you're not going to be as successful as you can be. You're also not going to see what people around you have the potential to be coming. You need to think outside the box, ladies and gentlemen, because that is how you become adapted to a situation. That is how you evolve in real time of what's going on. And I cannot tell you how many times that I was handed something, was told, here, put this in your seat bag, we'll talk about it later. Right. It's the first time I've seen it. And we're talking, this is literally three days before we're deploying. I don't know what this is. I have no clue what I'm supposed to do with it. All I know is I'm supposed to adapt to it, throw it in there, take it, and hopefully you're going to tell me what this is. You know, and, and it comes back to, to, to where we were with systems. And I'll get back to his talk on that point, is uh, you've got law, you have small, and you have AT4, which is a disposable anti all of which uh, shoot effectively under 300 yards, but not much past that. And hit probabilities, target match criteria, it's just not there. And you, you and me both, uh, I was guilty as a you were guilty as a team leader and a squad leader. Uh, handed this thing, and you're glad that you have something that just goes boom. Uh, shooting an anti tank round at an Adobe the best course of action. So uh, we looked at a weapon, uh, you know, long after you had got out, and I was probably nearing about my 18th year of service, uh, 19th year of service, so pretty long in the tooth. Uh, but I went back and I looked at the Carl Gustav, and a little bit on that history. Gun's been around since 1948. It's named after the King of Sweden. Uh, we looked back at some historical timeline stuff in 62. Uh, the Carl Gustav, as we start to know it now, was the M2 version, weighed about 32 pounds. Probably too heavy to use, but hey, the Japanese defense forces lug that thing around. Uh, get to the mid '60s, uh, the or excuse me, the mid '80s, the M3 Carl Gustav uh, came to pass, and it weighed about 22 and a half pounds. So you can start to see how the weight's starting to get cut, the guns starting to catch up uh, with the times, and then uh, 
2014-ish, uh, we started to develop what is known as the M4 Carl Gustav. Uh, when Marines receive it, it's going to be the M3-1 Carl Gustav. And the reason we're not calling it the M4 is because we have the M4 carbine and not to get that nomenclature confused. So having a 14 and a half pound gun that has a vast family of ammunition to the point that the Marine Corps is going to qualify nine of that nine of those rounds, uh, it's game changing for Marines. And when it comes down to it, Sean, we need a weapon system and we identified a gap in our requirement to close with and destroy the enemy. Uh, we identified a gap that required a gun that's going to quicken the kill chain, therefore uh, increasing lethality and survivability at the squad level. I would rather send an enemy to meet their maker than you, me, or one of our brothers that took, um, and took our place uh, having to attend another memorial service. So, which brings me fast forward that up to uh, round about, I want to say spring of 2015. Uh, I was out at second recon and go back through my time as a Marine. And we always had to make an excuse for our shoulder fired munitions. And to the point, can you ever recall our shoulder fired munitions being a bid for success in any of the big gunfights we got in? No. Uh, the problem with our munitions is that we had, uh, so you know we're talking about the small, if anybody is curious about that, is that these weapon systems, even though they may have packed a punch, they were so cumbersome, they were so awkward to carry. And honestly, you couldn't carry more than maybe two rounds with these damn things. That's not including the gunner. That'd be if you had an ammo man to carry it. But the biggest problem that I had is that you look at a weapon system that's designed to do a big impact on your aggressive force you're going against. The problem is, is that when it's only capable of hitting something 300, 400 yards, that's small arms range. That's yeah. too close and for then, comfort, then, my and friend. Then, and then what, one out of three shots? Then you have one out of three shots that may hit its target, that may do what it's supposed to do. And the problem is, like you said earlier, you can't take an anti-tank round and throw it at a mud hut because it's not designed for that. Even if people are like, oh, it's anti-tank. It's a totally different system. The materials absolutely, completely 180 degrees different from each other. So that's where you look at some of the rounds you had for that system compared to what you have for Carl Gustav. The versatility of it is something that is on par. It is something that is very unique. And like I said before, it is adaptive to almost any situation. Right. So uh, we got to the spring of 2015. Uh, at that point, I just... And I remember one of the last ranges I did with 3-2, I was out in the, I was out in Qatar doing a range. And uh, one of the squad leaders for one of the 51 section had boresighted his guns, set up a really awesome range, shot eight, eight, eight of the small rounds and was 0 for 8. So I was like, wow. And the kid looks at me and he says, Gunner, I don't know what I did wrong. I was like, well, I watched you, I thought you did foresight right. And I found myself apologizing for a weapon system. I should never have to look at an infantry marine and say, we owe you a better gun. That's, that's not cool. We, we owe it to them to give them a good. So I leave three, two, uh, as, as in the Marine Corps, you can get orders. I find myself at second recon and the recon Marines would come up to me and say, Hey, why don't we have Carl Gustav? And I joke, I'm like, who the hell's Carl Gustav? And they all kind of laugh. I know what the Carl Gustav is, uh, but I'm not very well educated because we simply did. So I started to get educated. I went and found some information and I seen the older Carl Gustav, as we spoke of earlier, and it was 22 and a half pounds. I said, ah, I'm going to have a hard time, uh, you know, selling that idea to Marines. Moreover, I don't think we should be carrying a 22 and a half pound launcher. So I reached out to the people who make the gun, Saab, and uh, their rep is Jack Seymour. Jack Seymour is a retired Green Beret weapon sergeant. I talked to Jack and I said, hey, I really like the capabilities of the Carl Gustav round sweep, but that round, that launcher's kind of heavy. He says, well, you're in luck. We just started producing the M3E1 Carl Gustav. It's 14 and a half pounds. And that's comparable to what we carried with the SALT, Sean. And that thing was a pain in the butt. Our SALT SALs were junk, uh, belt fed weapons, so on and so forth. Uh, <laughs> but it was, to the point is, that was a weapon of comparable weight that wasn't worth carrying. Right. is my point right so uh i said okay we can live with that weight that's not going to burden a marine so i've got 14.7 pound gun and all the rounds weigh about seven pounds a piece uh, with the probabilities of hit that are 70 percent i said hey 
it makes sense for Marines to have a gun that does this. Probability of the hit, family of ammunition, this gun fits. And I think it'll be a game changer for us. So at that point, I started to work towards putting together what is called a Deuns. A Deuns? What exactly is a Deuns? That is a deliberate universal need statement. So that's kind of the official way for a user, which me, user, gunfighter, uh, uses through the Marine Corps chain to say, hey, here's our requirement to close with and destroy. And here is our gap with our rocket slash shoulder fired capability. Now, you don't ever just jump up and down on a box and say by Carl Gustav. You pin your need statement and then you go talk to your peers. Uh, think back to when we were in 3-6 together and you were one of my team leaders or my, one of my squad leaders. Uh, always came and asked you guys what you think. Hey, does this make sense? Is there a better way of doing this? Uh, it was, everybody kind of had a vote, right? So to make sure that I wasn't crazy, I mean, I am from West Virginia, right? I'm a little off, been, been rocked a time or two. I said, let me go talk to my gunner brethren. So I set up a brief. And 14 gunners attended, two battalion commanders and a regimental commander. And we had a MARSOC operator show up that had received a bronze star for valor employing the Carl Gustav in Afghanistan. And we did the brief and he talked about what a game changer it was. And as I was talking to all the gunners, the two uh, battalion commanders and the regimental commander, I will have you know, Sean, that every man in that room minus the gunner in the room uh, was like, man, JC, you don't have to sell us the gun sells it. And at that point, I realized I was on to. And interestingly enough, and you spoke. To, you know, if you're that old guy that's out there or the Marine Corps. Sometimes that's not the answer. So I would ask everybody that's going to take the time to listen to this video and watch us talk about this. Uh, think about what you're doing with your Marines. If you're giving them something that doesn't increase lethality and survivability by quickening the kill chain, by pushing fires and capabilities down to the lowest level, you're wasting your time. Because at the end of the day, troop welfare and mission accomplishment, troop welfare is nothing, nothing more than what? Survivability. Troop, troop How do I look out for the combat wealth of my Marines? And I told that gunner, I said, well, we got systems right now that shoot three football fields and hit one out of three shots. Now I'm no, I'm no damn math wizard, but that's, that's not good in 2015. And all the other gunners are like, you're absolutely right. So from there, Sean, I progressed to writing the need state. Uh, about that time, there was a big change in all the gunners that were in the second Marine division at our home. And when the other gunners came in, I had a uh, three regimental gunners, Schwendinger, uh, Gunner Schwendinger, Gunner Schertz, Gunner McGuire, uh, two of my good friends, uh, Gunner Jeremy Barone, Gunner Johnny Costa, and a man by the name of Chris Wade, who was our division gunner. So we all get together one day at the food court at, at the, at the uh, big PX in Camp Lejeune. I present them with the Duns. We start to talk about it. And uh, they're like, wow, man. And Chris looks at me and he goes, this needs to be in the hands of every maneuver infantry unit in the Marine Corps. So uh, at the time we thought, hey, this belongs with the recon man. It belongs with the LAR scout. It belongs with the combat engineer. And more importantly, it belongs within the rifle squad. So instead of inundating Marines with three systems that don't do anything particularly well uh, for the current target set of light infantry, let's give them one gun that does everything three or four times better than those systems. So from that point, we pinned the Duns and we got it approved uh, from the division commanding general uh, through the two MEF commanding general and ultimately uh, Marine Forces Command Three Star Level, uh, which led to a shoot off hosted by the Commandant of the Marine Corps up in Quantico, the Carl Gustav versus the small two. So you guys had like an actual like get together where pretty much you took two weapon systems and put them head to head? Right. Right. That's so, awesome. you want me? You want me? You want me to elaborate on this? Oh no, hundred percent. Because that's I, that, that's what I love. I love when anytime we had to go to like a some not say a symposium, but they would bring something off the range and they'd be like, "We think about this." I remember they're like highlighting new turret systems. Where if little quick heavy on off the small, I know. 
but it's it, it's it's just the fact that like I remember before we deployed, they had this company come out that had these new turret systems. They had a turret system that was a swing arm. They had a turret system that was a rotary crank, and the way it was. Now compared right. to the system that we had, where it was basically just a lock, you twist it like this, and that was it. And we were like, oh my god, as a machine gunner, this is something I want because I could sit there and put the fifty cal up there, lock it in place, and instead of maneuvering it like this, if I know it's got to go in a straight line. I'll just put the butterfly down and start rotating thing, and I'm going to do a complete straight line across whatever area I got straight to come back and forth instead of trying to do this where you're where you're, you're off balance or whatnot. Right. So for precision wise, we love the new turrets, and those were the turrets that we ended up getting. You know, and I was actually excited that we had to have an in, uh, a little bit of input on that and a little bit of say because we enjoyed that. So they actually listened to us. So yes. I want you to go ahead and elaborate in as much detail and you can be as vulgar <laughs> if you want with this thing because again, it's a weapon system that had a purpose. Times change. You want something else new, let's do modern and they can adapt to anything. So no, I want to hear how the small went against the new Carl Gustav. So uh, to your point though, when we did the shoot off, we were simply showing the capabilities around. So uh, we get up there, we have the shoot. And I've learned this, and if you're a Marine out there, take, take note of this and remember this. When it comes to civilians within the Department of Defense, oftentimes, just because I have no ill will in my heart toward these people, because I've learned to deal within the confines of the DOD and government, how they purchase and do things. They will oftentimes defend a requirement, not a capability. What do I mean by that? If a guy's livelihood is division clock must sudden you show up with an M60 and that guy dies on an island defending the mud. Okay? Uh, kind of ran into the same thing with the small versus Carl Gustav conversation. Uh, bitter pill to swallow when you have a, a need statement signed by three generals uh, essentially telling the Marine Corps we have a, a gap. Uh, meanwhile, they were halfway down the pipe of getting the replacement small, which was the small two. So I get on a range and imagine I'm out there on the range, me and three other gunners, to include the senior gunner in the Marine Corps at the time, me and a buddy of mine named Gunner Costa. Uh, we're up on the line. And like you would expect on a range, here comes the commandant with, with his entourage, like three black suburbans, a van. Yeah. Uh, before the range went, Civilians were telling Marines that were small, which happened to be Marines that worked for me when I was the gunner for three. Uh, they were, they pulled me to the side. They're like, hey, gunner, the people, the civilians that brought us out here were telling us bad thing the Carl Gustav is and this, that, and the other. And I said, be a professional, offer your opinion if I ask, and put your best foot forward shooting your small. Meanwhile, a couple of MARSOC operators were invited to shoot the Carl Gustav. Uh, and they had to do so with a fire control system that they had never employed before. And they had about two or three hours to get ready for that. So uh, you can kind of see how the situation is starting to stack itself to make the goose look bad. Because again, people defend, uh, they defend uh, requirements, not capabilities. So me and Gunnar Costa get up there and there is a civilian that says, you guys aren't allowed on the range. Now imagine a civilian telling two. <laughs> so, Get the hell out of here. Imagine this shit. So okay. I go on and I tell this man, I say, hey, check it out. Uh, the division CG sent me and Gunnar Costa here to be the representation for the second Marine division. And we will absolutely be on this range. Well, you're not on the list. I said, well, let me call my CG real quick. Well, you know, you know, I said, we're coming on the range. We get on the range, Commandant shows up, and uh, I've got a MARSOC. I've got a picture of an operator holding the car. I don't know if you've got it. Uh, you Let me take a look. Let me take a look for it. I think I might have that. Let's see. I think I might have shown it already, but I'm going to assume this is the one you're talking about. The one that's got all the weapons, uh, munitions next to it and everything? All the munitions. Yep. So... Commandant shows up, everybody gathers around. And the program manager for the Army starts to talk a little bit about the gun. Immediately, immediately, a senior sergeant major starts shilling for the old weapon system. And he says, 
why do I need this thing to shoot smoke? He goes, I can obscure with a 203. Gunnar Costa, and I love him for this. He goes, hey, Sergeant Major. He goes, the 203 is a squad marking device. It's not used for obscuration. Then <laughs> this guy just continues. And then he says, well, I can use the mortar and the assault. You know, if I've got if I've got direct line of sight, I can use the, the, the assault mortar and X, Y, and Z. I said, yeah, a charge zero mortar uh, hitting in the assault is like a one in 100 <laughs> shot. Carl Gustav could run circles around that with a five or six minute per five or six round per minute rate of fire and it has accurate effects out past a thousand. So we just keep handing this guy's ass back. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's a couple of colonels, there's a one star, star general, and then uh, the three star says, he goes, well, you know, we always go with what we know. Interesting to say that, General, because when I went to war, we packed away the small and we made do with our machine guns and our mortars because it, it wasn't a combat capability worth using. And it was it was it was so funny being in front of the commandant and watching one from Boston and one from West Virginia hand these guys <laughs> their ass back and forth in front of the commandant. So uh, commandant goes, he, he observes the shoot and then he shoots the Carl Gustav. That's Sean, awesome. I, I That's thought this awesome. was this was going to be a deal breaker. He shot the goose, and he got scope bit by it because he oh, got his okay. eye right up in the scope. Okay. Commandant cuts his nose open, but we get done, and the commandant says, "I appreciate the hard work today, and I'm glad the gunners are out here." And he goes, "You guys definitely earned your paycheck." He didn't say yes. He didn't say no. And everybody and all these these senior Marines were all uh, kind of joking, like, "Oh." That's the end of you. The commandant cut his nose. Right. But like any wise general officer or any senior Marine for that matter, uh, he didn't show his hand. He didn't. Uh, and as we were, as we wrapped up, uh, the small shot shot its first shot at 150 yards. And a, I forget the, the vehicle type, but it was something about the size of an Amtrak. Okay. They aimed center mass. They missed to the left. They held right edge in the next three shots. At 150 yards. Okay. Well, no kidding. I would hope you hit that. Right. Uh, the goose gunner said, "Well, we're going to take shots at 300." So they shot a couple <laughs> at 300, a couple at a couple at 550. Okay. Yeah. And they they hit three of them for sure. Uh, they missed one at 5, and one of them at 550 hit low. But as soon as it hit low on the target. That old sergeant major and that general both started piping up saying, oh, that was a miss. That was a miss. Uh, both of them, one, the general's got glasses about that thick. And he's just saying, that was a miss. It was a miss. And I'm looking through binos. I'm like, sir, it was a hit. It was just low. Now, mind you, this isn't J.C. Knight, the sob guy. This is right. Gunner Knight from Second Recon right. defending this gun. So we get done with the shoot and the Army program manager and a retired Navy SEAL from that works for Crane who evaluates and tests with them pulls me aside. He goes, hey, Gunner. He goes, that is the most unprofessional, screwed up thing that I have ever, ever seen. He goes, your own people tried to cut your legs out from under you. Right. And I said, well, John, I said, his name's John. I said, John, it's okay. Uh, we're going to continue to push because we know this is the right thing for Marines. Meanwhile, one of the... Uh, defending a program over understanding capabilities guy like butts into my conversation and he's like well we go with what we know and we're going to blah 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 and you know and he interrupts this lady that's trying to talk who works for the army pm show i said well as a user community as a user community we're going to continue to push for this system because we know it's the right thing for the infantry marine and uh he interrupted me again, and I said, buddy, and I'm going to use nice words here. I said, buddy, I said, I'm going to tell you right now, it is obvious to me that you do not care about the combat welfare of the Marines. He goes, you saying I don't care about Marines? I said, did I blank stutter? Right. And, of course, Gunnar Cost is like pulling me. But uh, I made it known that I didn't appreciate what I was doing. And uh, what it boiled down to is... Uh, a lot of civilians, senior Marines, were loyal to a person, a process, and a material uh, that wasn't best for the infantrymen. And always be guided by this that are out there listening. 
always be guided for what's best for the infantryman, not because of your loyalty to somebody else. It's like you and me, Sean. If you and me had a disagreement about a weapon, and we both knew in our hearts and minds that what we were doing was best for the infantry marine, we could walk away from professionals and not lose any sleep over. Oh, hundred percent. And that's and that's the thing about it is that you're not pushing a product, you're not trying to maintain you know, your career or or some other crap like that. You people say all the time, "Well, well this is what you got to do." This is what's guys here. It's like, okay, it doesn't. That's great. That sounds good on paper, but in actuality, you have to look out every single day about what's going to bring our boys home, what's going to make them more combat effective, what's going to be able to get them in there, get the job done as fast as humanly possible. And I mean, it's it, think about it. Why aren't we using the M1 Grand still? General Patton said it was the greatest weapon ever made in World War II because technology changes. Things adapt. War fighting tactics change. You have to be more malleable to the surrounding environment. And that's, that's like I said earlier in the program, that's the biggest cop-out I hate is when somebody says, this is the way we do it and this is the way we've been doing it. Then that, and if, you're, if you have to say that, you got to defend your thing that way, then it is time 100% to change it. Right. Because that's the way so, it works. So we get through that, and lo and behold, uh, Sean, about a year later, the commandant, and he says, uh, yes, we're going, Carl Gustav. <laughs> and though we've purchased some small twos, we're going to go ahead and we're going to push those to the engineers. And uh, engineers have that now. For, from what I can gather, they're not having them. And eventually they'll end up with Carl Gustav as well. So uh, Carl Gustav one is going to every single rifle squad in the Marine Corps. Uh, eventually, I think it's going to be in the hands of our combat engineers and also, also uh, our recon men. So I, I'm hopeful for that. Uh, along the way, the Corps is also going to qualify nine of our rounds. Uh, I don't know if you've got a picture of the, the, the round tree. Yeah, I have a detailed one uh, that kind of it doesn't spe specifically say what they are. Uh, I'll put yep. that one up there, and then I have one that's also going to show the Carl Gustav what what each one is bracketed into. This is anti armor. This is HE right. for high, for personnel. So I'll put both those up there while you're talking. Yeah. So and again, the infantry leaders go by this. Uh, what do I mean by that? In training, it's not no longer like you and me would go up and Sean is. Oh, we're going to go out and do a rocket range. No, we're going to go do a Carl Gustav range but we are drawing these particular types of rounds because this is the target set that we're trying to eliminate. So you have to be a thinking man's infantryman uh, in training with this. Uh, again, you look at that gun, it's got HE, it's got HEDP, it's got a number of different rounds. You can actually put the enemy in a combined arms dilemma, with how we fight with one damn weapon system. That, that's pretty amazing. Well, that's one of the best things that I read up on it is this that it is something that you could basically look at situation on the fly, you know, because I know as a, not say as an operator, but as a Marine infantryman, you know, you carry different type of rounds for what you're going to do. You know, you may carry two HEs, you may carry three, you know, anti-tank. It just depends on what your situation you're going to. What are we accomplishing? What are we trying to, you know, spook out? What are we trying to kill pretty much? And with this thing, it's just that I've never seen a rocket launching system that has the versatility of this thing and basically the the amount of rounds is it's not say it's infinite obviously because there's a set value but it's like there hasn't been one situation where you don't have a round specifically designed for that scenario right now obviously if i have to shoot a bunker with a heat round it can do that uh if i have to shoot a uh, a multi-target round at you know a take your pick a bunker whatever i can do that okay there there's a lot of versatility in all of these different rounds, but you can specifically tailor whatever you're taking on patrol based off of your targets. So that's pretty awesome. No, it's definitely a really great system, you know, and I'm actually excited that I get to talk to you personally, you know, about it and get a little more insight than what you normally would, most people would go ahead and look at. Um, so besides the Commandant shoot, obviously the aftermath to where we are now, when is it that we're looking at, I don't know if you can answer that question or is it something that's still kind of classified a little bit, but when is it that we're looking to get these things implemented uh, basically around the military? Like, this is what we're going with. This is the new thing. This is not so, no an implementation right. to where we're trying to experiment with it. This is in the States. This is what we're using. And here it is for here on out. There are a handful of Army units that have. And because we're asking for the Marine Corps, when I say we, Obviously, those of you that are listening know when I say we, I'm talking about Marines. 
Uh, the Army's only going to qualify about four or five rounds. Marines are going to ask for about nine rounds out of that week. Okay. And I think that, that's that's a good idea. Uh, you've got all the, you, you offer the whole carousel of ammo to base, based on your, your target set. So we're going to get fielded a little bit later. Obviously, the U.S. government has to pay SOB before those guns get sent over. So it took a while to get that done. Uh, thank you, Mattis. Uh, you know, uh, broke that checkbook out, uh, got it approved. Uh, some of the guns have already been purchased, but uh, having a bunch of guns sitting there without ammo is really difficult. So we're, we're waiting for the rounds to catch up to the guns. We should see some buildings at the end of this year, Sean. Uh, okay. Start to get them out, doing some new equipment trainers and get them out in the hands of Marines. So uh, that's when we're looking at seeing it. Here it the there's a slide that I have here. I don't know if I'm allowed to show it or not, but is it's the one that shows like the current capabilities of the M3, where it shows around, shows the... Uh, pretty much the the attack on target by the meters that it can which i think is fascinating because you know i'm looking at one of the rounds here where it says it can hit something over a thousand meters you never hear about that that's something you right. just don't hear you never heard about that in the past you know, decade or two that i was in you and just did the, uh, yeah and in regards to that that is the he441 round and when they did the sea dragon experiment out on out on the west coast they actually had a Marine, I believe it was from 3-5, that after about an hour or two class, he was smacking a target at 1285 with <laughs> the old Carl Gustav. That's that's crazy. Now, again, uh, I don't think we're that that's an everyday shot that we're going to need to take. But think about this right now, Sean. All the weapon systems it takes to get combined arms to 300 yards on the squad level, you've got the M4, you've got the, the law, AT4. Uh, 203 Mark 32 M320, all those weapons. I named off six or seven weapons, and I'm only dominating 300 yards of battle. Right. That's ridiculous in 2020. Oh, 100%. Absolutely ridiculous. Um, current service rifle, the I 550 meters. Carl Gustav with HE and HEDP easily does that. I've nearly doubled the amount of battle space I can cover based off of two weapon systems. Uh, Think about how much time I've given back to the unit leaders and the commander uh, by knocking down the amount of weapon systems they need to carry to prosecute a target or target sets. Well, not I'm, not only saying you have to, I'm not saying you have to get rid of all those other weapon systems, but you've got two primary weapons that does all of them, your battle rifle and the Carl Gustav. No, well, that's exactly what we did back in 04 when we deployed to Afghanistan. You know, we deployed with all of our weapon systems, but how many do we actually use? We used to what the environment allowed and to what our mission was. But now you're talking about battle space. When you've increased the engagement range from 300 to 400 meters to 1,000 meters, and you're halting the progression of the enemy, that's given our leaders a lot of time to think of what the next move is going to be. It's like in a game of chess. Right. The more time you have to think about something, the better the move is going to be. And think about this too. If you, if if I'm putting HE or HED on, on, on an enemy position and uh, my mortars are slow, if I've got a, a loom round for the Carl Gustav shoots 2,100 meters, I can illuminate at the squad level. Yeah. And moreover, think of the flexibility now that that platoon has having three Carl Gustavs in one platoon. Case in point, Sean. Remember the night we had our what was I think it was our second engagement when uh. Uh, the company Gunny was in in a, in a contact with Murray's squad, and you and me got on the 250 cows. Okay, yes. And we were pushing max order on those 250s at two clicks away. We couldn't see the target very well, but we could see flashes from the muzzles of the enemy two clicks away. Imagine Correct. if we were able to light that objective. We were shooting a Carl Gustav right beside those two gun trucks. Lighting that objective up, what would that have done for the guys on the ground that were fighting on the squad level. Oh, they would be able to see their targets and got rid of the targets fast and maneuver so they can yeah. go ahead and close with destroy. Who stopped with them? It would have changed the way right. that we fight. And right. uh, that flexibility is what I think makes it special. And uh, I think it, there's no doubt in my mind that when we get it in the hands of Marines, it's going to be a game changer. And I think it's going to cut down on memorial services. And uh, as a, I've often said, it's a, it's a good day for us. And it's a bad day for the enemy. Oh, not only that, Marines also like shiny new toys, and this thing's got a lot of potential for a lot of scenarios. So. Right. Uh, one, one thing I get often, wow, they're, they're getting rid of the 50. Uh, check it out. Uh, rarely did I see the 51 get trained very well, plus we didn't promote him. So putting one of these in the rifle squad 
is not going to overburden the squat. Right. Uh, and, and I could elaborate on that, but I'm going to I'm going to hold that off until we do our next segment where we talk a little bit about specs of the gun and, and rounds. The, uh, the the Marines, I think that that I can really brag about being a 51, and not saying that you know 0351s are anything smaller than any other MOS out there, especially in, in no. the infantry. But when Granddad is sitting there going on a beach with a flamethrower because that was the issued weapon back in World War II. Those are the 50 right. ones that could sit there and talk about how great they were. I mean, that's that's some crazy stuff. But right. the, the 50 ones that, that I worked with were amazing Marines. And the best thing about that is that they really did a lot of cross-training because people didn't realize this is that your 50 ones and your machine guns worked hand-in-hand -hand because most of the time we're providing cover fire where they were taking a shot because you have to. But as soon as that thing goes off, there's going to either be a trail, they're going to hear it, they're going to see it. But if we can keep their heads down with the 50 cals and the 240s, you know, that's going to give them time to get out of their shot and get back into cover. Could you imagine one of our guys going into from a partially concealed, concealed position and start taking nine mil spotting shot? He'd be gone. It's, it, it, it's unfeasible. It's, it's not going to work because as soon as you shoot, because guess what? Trace is worth both plays, ladies and gentlemen. If people don't realize that, if you can see it, so can they. And it's not common sense to sit there and just say, oh, it came from there? Okay, well, the shield over there. You might not be able to see it, but if you're shooting in an area, guess what? That's a problem for the people that are in that area. Right. No, so, the so spot, I never understood the spotting rounds. I really uh -huh. didn't. I, I, I didn't. Uh, so we, I, we, we, got, we, we got a little off track. It's all right. Where, where the gun was. Uh, briefly, we talked about what got it to this level. Uh, and again, just key takeaways for, for you guys that are out there listening. Always talk about combat capabilities with your commanders, your gunners, and your senior enlisted. Always talk to them about gaps because nobody understands it better than the Marines that are living. So whenever you get, whenever a commander gets in front of you, or a gunner, or a master gunnery sergeant, senior enlisted, heads of schoolhouses, and there's a gap, uh, don't be afraid to say something. I remember the one of the first times I mentioned this gun in front of all the CWO five in the Marine Corps. A lot of them yelled at me and they're like, sit down and shut up. I'm like, hell no, I'm not going to sit down and shut up. Uh, this is the right thing for our Marines. And I believed in it. I stood for it and uh, I fought for it. And uh, I'm glad that we won on behalf of the infantry Marine. Sean, I, I truly believe it, it's going to be a game changer. Accuracy, flexibility, uh, lethality. It's what matters. And by quickening the kill chain, think about this. I have corporals now that are going to be able to call a which is a battle damage assessment for those of you that don't know that acronym. Vice calling him, requesting permission to fire. Right. And we know what a, we know what a damn goat rope. That that was the one thing that I I could not understand. I could not believe that we would see them. We can get them, and we could end this. You know engagement real quick but i gotta wait for hire to get approval that's absolutely absurd that's right. absolutely so, absurd so this quickens the kill chain for us uh i think that's all for this episode uh you got any closing thoughts no i tell you what you know everything you said it was spot on it's something that people don't get a chance to really the inside scoop on i hope they enjoy this episode and i don't got anything more to add because you had everything else in this episode where you talked about how the biggest thing that matters is the Marine's life or that soldier's life or that combat, you know, uh, you know veteran's life that's going to sit there and use these things because you want everybody to come home. And again, when it comes to leadership, you hit it spot on. Leaders out there, never, ever disregard somebody in platoon. Don't always think that you know everything because I guarantee you there might be some PFC, there might be somebody out there that just may have a good idea. And if that good idea sticks, then guess what? That's what you can use. And just a thought from me to you, people go their whole lives asking, you know, what have I accomplished? What have I done? Did I do enough? Brother, I think in your case, with the rock star lifestyle that you had while you're in and, of course, the rock star lifestyle that you have now that you're out, you did leave your mark on the Marine Corps. And there isn't a lot of people that can say that. I always will say this, a good quote from the Four Horsemen, it's always duplicated or it's always imitated never duplicated because that's what you did a lot of people say that they did something but did they really you my friend could rest easy and know that you've left something that's gonna a contribute to the legacy that the United States military is and b it's going to better it for what it is in the whole actual picture so that's awesome 
brother, I'm just humbled and thankful for being on the team, man. And I think it's gonna, I think it's gonna help our guys. So with that, Sean, I think we sign off here and uh, see you guys on the next episode. Yes, sir. Stay tuned for more episodes. If you guys like this, go ahead and leave comments after we post this. Tell us what you like, what you didn't like. Go ahead and tell us some other weapon systems that maybe you want to sit there and learn more information about. That's what makes it interesting because this whole thing is dynamic that you can create the content that you want to see. And if it's something that you want to do, we'll put it out there. So y'all have a great day. Stay safe out there. And keep going forward. Semper Fi. Semper Fi.